Last weekend, we kicked off our new sermon series titled Surprised by Hope, the Christ Event. Christianity, since its beginning, has been a movement. When Jesus Christ, the apex of the divine revelation, was revealed, the disciples found hope in Him. People experienced holistic restoration and healing in Christ. They found joy in following after the Master, even though sufferings and persecution and even martyrdom were foreseen, the disciples could not be stopped from confessing Jesus as their Lord and following after his footsteps. Why? What was it that compelled them to following Jesus? What hope and joy did they see in Jesus? And how does that translate into where we are here and now? Through this new uh, series, the Christ event, surprised by hope, I pray that the Lord will guide us to re-grasp the holistic understanding of the gospel centered around the Christ event. And with a humble posture and eagerness to find Jesus again in our lives, I pray that we establish our authentic, personal, and also communal relationship with the person of Jesus. We will rediscover the joy and hope in following Jesus. And today, it is my great joy and pleasure to introduce our preacher, our own dear Senior Director of Integration, Insil Kang. For the past few years, God has spoken through her in so many occasions through the means of preaching in our own student ministries, children's ministries, and also in many other churches in, in the nation on their Sundays. And it is my great joy to see God speaking through her to us this morning. Please welcome Insil Kang. Today marks the start of a week of remembrance for Christians, where the focus is on the final moments of Jesus' life and ministry leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. This is called Passion Week or Holy Week. This is often a time of grateful grieving as we sit with the context and agony of Jesus' sacrifice for us. In our multicultural church, we often observe various spiritual traditions in this season. Uh, maybe fasting, abstaining from things in observance of Jesus' sacrifice, fasting from social media, favorite foods and habits, reading a Lenten reflection book, prayer in many heart languages. For some of us, being in our fields is our favorite, and we relish an opportunity for corporate mourning. For others of us, this is not our favorite time in the Christian calendar. Can we get to the resurrection already? Can we eat some chocolate now? I know some of us haven't yet had a very long relationship with Jesus or are just starting to get to know him, which is truly wonderful. So talking about and celebrating his love for you might seem strange. Or even with a long relationship with Jesus, you are in a dry heart space today. Does this really affect me? I know I'm supposed to be grateful, but do I really matter to him? Or maybe we know the story so well that it no longer impacts us. Jesus triumphs. It's all about his victory for us. Huzzah and on to the next week. All positive, always winning. Let's look at all these questions. Let's face the weakness and failure at the center of Passion Week. Let's receive a renewed call and love to follow Jesus. This past year, we had to face so much truth and not much of it was triumphant or victorious. No more faking it. What could we fake? Our capacity as human beings caring for other human beings, our ability to work, the value of work in our society, surfacing our real opinions about each other, rethinking church. We were literally unable to do anything to fix these things other than to stay at home. Even if we tried, we couldn't. Does this year even count? Was it a failure? I invite us now to take time in a story that went alongside the passion of Christ, a story of failure and weakness, a story of not being able to live up to our best efforts, the story of our all too relatable brother, Peter. Many of you know something about Peter or Simon Peter. He was a fisherman, one of the first to know Jesus as their rabbi, their teacher, and a devoted follower and friend, willing to die for Jesus and the cause, he said. In Mark 14, 27 to 28, we see Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, 
I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Even though others may denounce you, Lord, I will not. Peter and his friends had formed an amazing bond as they traveled and witnessed the miracles and teachings of Jesus up to this point in the gospel narrative. Think about the strong connection and special affection you build when you're traveling with a group, experiencing something unique and new together. It's hard to explain or recapture that feeling of that bond to people who weren't with you. It can be easy to think of the disciples as part of the backdrop to the epic story of Jesus, as just a dramatic foil needed for asking clarifying questions so that we get more of Jesus' answers to study, um, or further examples of what not to do. But they were part of the story, and human too. Emotional, thinking, scheming, doubting people who tried their best to understand and follow this life-disrupting Jesus, this prophecy unfolding in ways and impact wholly different than what they had ever considered. No one was like Jesus. They were with him all the time. They took his instruction on everything. They were doing what they were thought was their best in following Jesus. They loved him like a friend. They believed Jesus was the one their people had prophesied, told stories about for generations. They believed he was the savior who was supposed to come and set their people free and make them powerful, their hope for making an unjust life right. They even vied for recognition and some vertical movement professionally in Jesus' future kingdom. Eyes and motivations on certain expectations of a future with Jesus. So we arrive now to the night of Jesus' betrayal, being turned over to the council of their own people's chief priests and elders, ultimately to be found guilty and killed for admitting he was indeed the Son of God. But we'll start a few hours before that, um, where the disciples are in a room with Jesus, taking part in a final meal together. As modern Western humans, we mention how the disciples were reclined at the table to eat. Yes, it is a wonderfully different custom for taking a meal and actually debated as better for digestion. But let's also think about the safety and the vulnerability that they felt to be able to do that. We know that some at this table are plotting and scheming the ultimate betrayal of their teacher, Jesus. Some might be pondering the events that have happened up to this point. How did Jesus even know where they were going to be eating this meal to such advanced detail? Some might be thinking and talking at a different level than Jesus, wondering if a revolution was about to take place soon. Um, why did Jesus teach them the lessons he had just been teaching them? But they were all there together physically relaxed enough to take part in the most disarming communal fellowship of eating together. At this point, they are still the group of 12 and Jesus. They are still the close band of followers. This posture is good to remember because then Jesus tells them in Mark 14, 18 and 19, that he will be betrayed by someone in that very room, part of this intimate group of friends taking this meal right now, someone eating with them right now, and they each get very upset, asking if it's them. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, it says, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and say to him one after another, is it I? It's startling and shocking to think about this in the midst of a meal. How do you make sense of this statement in this moment? Jesus is breaking the peace and we begin in earnest with the events of the night before his death. Like what some of us do when we listen to sermons, Peter thought that Jesus' message was for someone else. He is confident. Peter believes he won't be the one of, uh, he won't be one of the weaker disciples who will scatter away from Jesus when things get tough. He boldly states, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Jesus told them the absolute truth, that literal explanation of what would be happening. Did Peter really listen? Was he just ready to move on from an uncomfortable topic? Was he focused on getting on to the next thing and didn't have time to sit with this information? 
He was so convinced he wouldn't denounce Jesus that the other disciples even chime in with the same statement after him. Well, we know within a few paragraphs following this, everything changes. There is an anxious, long night, a violent arrest, an injustice planned in the secrecy of night at the hands of those in power. The disciples are scattered and Jesus faces his accusers and torture without them. We see in the telling of the events in John 18, 12, that after the meal, Judas turns his teacher Jesus over to the authorities. A single man, Jesus, arrested and bound by a band of soldiers, the captain, and the local officers. Peter draws his sword during this confrontation. It is the middle of the night. Everyone scatters, just like Jesus said they would. Uh, so we see in John 18 here, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was so cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. So Peter followed at a distance. He was below in the courtyard when Jesus is being accused inside. In Mark 14, 67, we see again, he's recognized by a servant to the high priest and asked if he was with Jesus earlier that night. Peter says he has no idea what she's talking about. Then the servant says to everyone around that he is one of Jesus' people. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. The rooster crows. And then others around say, but you look and sound like one of them, a Galilean. And Peter is now so upset and angry and curses that he is not. He doesn't even know this Jesus person. The rooster crows. He realizes in that moment that he has indeed failed Jesus. He denied him three times, denied knowing him, just like Jesus said he would, just like Peter promised he wouldn't, and he breaks down in shame and weeps. Are you not moved to feel so deeply for Peter? The immense weight on his shoulders, the pain and the heartbreak, the bottled up emotion and stress all releasing, the shame of his failure. He denied who he was with. He denied his belonging. He denied his people group. Who knows how he felt with each denial, but the gravity, the weight of his denials were all, encompass were all encompassing, overwhelming. He betrayed Jesus. He denied his entire identity. His identity was in relation to the Christ. He denied, he denied knowing Jesus, being with Jesus, being known as connected to Jesus, his vocation as a follower of Jesus. His denials even built up and overwhelmed him with emotion, cursing and swearing, it says, that he does not know Jesus. He hit a breaking point, and then the shame unleashed, he weeps. Shame, disbelief, exhaustion, now isolation, loneliness. Peter had been afraid of being mocked and ashamed, so he denied. He failed. How do you contend with the word fail, the concept of failure? It's so final. We can relate. Pandemic, again, talking about that. Our identities, our jobs and roles, our attempts to do our best making best case scenario promises without actually knowing the reality and outcomes, doing our best with what we know now, pressure from others, pressures we put on ourselves, we're set up to fail. Think back to the final meal where the disciples first heard from Jesus that one of them would betray him. How did they respond? They were sorrowful. The disciples asked and wondered, would they be the one? Tell me what I've done wrong so I can correct it, Jesus. They didn't want to fail. We worry if we'll fail, if we won't live up, if we'll disappoint. But failure is so final. It's the outcome we work so hard to avoid. It's the thing we don't know how to come back from. 
Is succeeding or failing really the walk of a follower of Jesus? Are there things we can do that provide no way back? Is God that punishing? Peter failed, yes. He didn't live up to his own standard, what he thought he could be. So what now? Where can we go from here? But this is the loving good news of the gospel. His failure was not final. His failure was completely redemptive. His failure was completely redemptive. He in his failure is redeemed, made whole, renewed. The passion of Jesus is love. The failure is necessary. Weakness is the way of and to Jesus. This mystery lies at the heart of the Christian gospel. Our failures are completely redemptive. We have only to continue with Peter to see how. Peter broke down and wept. He was ashamed. He was broken. Biblical scholar Cho Mina uh, con connects Peter's weaknesses, his shame, to the transformative and redemptive love of God. Peter's shame and weakness is fully transformed and redeemed by the love of God. She states, shame awakens our sense of who we are and what we hope to be. Shame awakens our sense of who we are and what we hope to be. It is not just the resulting feeling from failure, but the signal to ourselves of needing God's redemption. We know Peter's story doesn't end with this shameful, broken night. In John 21, we see Peter actually now rushing towards the resurrected Jesus. He didn't just rush to the Lord, he prepared himself quickly and threw himself into the sea, swam to shore, ran to his Lord, out of breath, soaked, not wanting to waste a single moment to be with Jesus. He ran for his life. And Jesus met him there, offering him life transformation and redemption by asking him three times if Peter loves him. Peter answers each time, yes, Lord. Is he nervous? Is he thinking about how he answered these questions the night of Jesus' arrest? Is he still ashamed by his failure? Peter builds up to the third emotional and final question to this answer, John 21, 17. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Don't miss the heart and posture of Jesus. He doesn't ask why, Peter, why did you fail? He doesn't say he's disappointed. He doesn't remind him of his weakness. Jesus is acknowledging Peter exactly as he is. Jesus is saying, Peter, I know. I know how you feel. I know how you have suffered. I know how failing hurt you. This is the good stuff, people, all the claps. This is the mind-bending, mind-bending, loving way of Jesus. Peter's weakness was what Jesus used to bring him back to being a disciple, to his vocational call to feed his sheep. Through the challenge shame can give us, we can be awakened to our sense of who we are and what we hope to be, who we are with, our identity and who we follow. Shame is now converted into constructive, transformative, productive search for integrity. Richard, uh, Richard Baucom from St. Andrews University in Scotland says it this way, Peter's failure is tremendously hopeful. It is the only way for Peter to stop thinking Jesus needs him. The only way for Peter to begin to see that it is Peter who needs Jesus to enable him to be a disciple the way Jesus wants him to be. Peter's failure qualifies him to begin to be a disciple on the way of the cross. Only by failing can Peter be raised up. His failure is God's success. John 21, seven. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work 
and he threw himself into the sea. When Peter saw he could return to Jesus, he threw himself to him. He stopped the work he was doing. He was reawakened to his sense of who he is, who he wanted to be with, to his integrity as a follower and lover of Jesus. And Jesus met him there, had prepared a meal for him, broke bread with him, fellowshiped with him. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. One of the last acts of fellowship before his death and resurrection, Jesus took bread and wine and broke and shared it with his disciples. He offered them communion in the most complete sense. The elements, yes, the Eucharist, but also communion with him, fellowship with him. Jesus offered them communion once again, a true do-over for Peter, a meal with his beloved friend and teacher, and then the opportunity to answer him directly, to answer Jesus directly. Three times did he love him. Three times, not because Jesus was making sure that Peter loved him, but because he wanted to fully restore Peter from complete failure to complete restoration. This isn't just a picture of God who is compassionate to our failure, our weakness, but a God who knows failure and weakness. He really knows. He knows how you tried. He knows your darkest failures, but he's not a judge ready to cancel and punish you out of anger and cruelty. He knows with compassion and pain. He is hurt because you are hurt. It is the greatest mystery of the cosmos, the divine dilemma, is that Jesus failed. Jesus failed. The almighty God, the everlasting God, the one who does not make mistakes, chose to fail. All the way to the cross, on the cross, cursed, slapped, tortured, condemned, spit on. The all-powerful, all-knowing God chose to fail. Many left Jesus when they saw their dream of a Messiah crucified on the cross. They left because they knew he failed. The revolution had ended before they thought it would. Things did not turn out the way they had expected. The Messiah has failed. So they turned and left thinking this was the end. But his failure was for God's will to be done truly his failure was for God's will to be done so that we would be saved. He was accused and asked. Christ answered, I am. He claimed the identity and role of our Savior. I am. Am, as in with and is. He claimed us in that answer. He claimed knowing us, being with us. He didn't deny us. But by doing that, he became even weaker, beaten, led to death for his love for us, failed, failure, weakness, weak Christ, failing Christ. Failure is necessary. Jesus' failure was necessary. But we know that was not the end. Failure is not an end with Jesus, but the beginning. Can we face our own failures and weaknesses with Jesus? Can we have them qualify us to begin to be what Jesus wants us to be? Not having to live up to what we think he wants us to be or how, but how he wants us to be. Can you trust that failure and weakness is the beginning with Jesus? Can we see past the marker of failure that is the cross? Can you see the life and restoration for our failures instead? Let's take this life-changing reality into our week. One thing I encourage you to do to reclaim your belonging to Jesus from the burden and lies of our world's view of success and failure is to take time to think of the things that you consider to be your weaknesses, your failures. Imagine how Jesus meets you in your weaknesses and failure and what he would say to you. Think of the words and make them your prayer dialogue with God each day. Second, the sanctuary has actually been specially prepared for you this week. You're invited to go on a spiritual walk with Peter in the redeeming weakness of Christ in a special Passion Week spiritual journey. 
You can sign up for your reserved time in this spiritual experience. And lastly, I invite us to participate now in communion as an expression of your hope and trust in Jesus, because his grace is sufficient for us. He turns our weakness into strength as we continue to walk with him, Jesus of the cross, Jesus of our restoration. Jesus knows, he sees you. He is the savior of the weak. He sees you trying, failing, running to him for another chance. May the Spirit open our eyes to see the living Jesus in us and the never-ending hope and loving invitation of the cross through this week. Amen. Please take a moment to get your communion elements ready now. Jesus offers us communion, fellowship with him, invitation to follow him through this symbolic meal. Like he offered the disciples, take of the bread and drink of the wine. The bread is a symbol of his body broken and given to us. The wine, juice or water, whatever you have, a symbol of his blood shed and poured out for us. This is not just for us to receive, but a reminder of our new and transformed life as his disciples. This is the hope offered in this meal. Please take and eat the bread and wine now.